Uh, welcome to Change 11. We are now running into, uh, I don't know, it depends on what you look at, what week we're actually in. In theory, I think we're week 16 of content, but we had a bit of an overlap over Christmas where we had a couple of weeks where we didn't run. So, uh, you know, I, I missed uh, Howard's session last week. I'll catch up on the recordings. Uh, welcome all to this session. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, I've had the pleasure of working with Valerie over, I don't know, it's probably been about three or four weeks, weeks, years, I should say, sorry. I uh, was involved first, uh, where I met her, actually, I think it was in Honolulu during an Ed Media session. That uh, was the first time I uh, connected uh, with Valerie, and she's uh, got a huge amount of interest in, obviously, the learning technology space. I think one of the things I find most fascinating about Valerie is her ability to get stuff done and also to bring people together for, for collaborative activities. So that's been uh, definitely a, a big strength that she brings and certainly encourage uh, sort of track the activities that she's involved with because generally it's uh, something very interesting and worth being a part of. Uh, Jillian, I had a chance to meet actually. We was in Lisbon this past year, and I think Jillian had at that point just accepted a position after she did a postdoc at Harvest. So she had accepted a position at, at UVic, and I imagine between the two of them, they'll be raising trouble for years to come. I think what's nice, especially with the, the dual uh, <laughs> representation, is that a lot of Valerie's work has been in uh, the audio slash video space in classrooms, and if I'm not misrepresenting Jillian's work, uh, it's been uh, involved with uh, games and simulation type activities. So looking forward to hearing a question that's obviously on everyone's uh, you know, mind, at least from a policy discussion level, and that is what does the 21st century university look like? Uh, again, thanks Valerie and Jillian. Thanks, George. Um, well, to start things off, I think I'll, let, I'll kick it off and then we'll go from there. Well, I think uh, this sort of line of, of inquiry began many years ago when um, actually Jill and I went to the University of Alberta together. Um, I was uh, doing my PhD when she was doing her master's and I remember quitting my job in Vancouver, moving provinces, getting an apartment right across uh, the street from the education building where I'd be doing my grad program and finding out on landing there that all three courses in my program were online. And being faced with the dissatisfaction of that. Um, I'm here, I'm on campus, I made the sacrifice. And I've heard, um, I didn't like having the, the delivery method dictated to me. Um, although I did have lots of face-to-face -face being in, in that zone. Um, similarly, um, I've heard the same thing uh, now that I'm at University of Victoria, which you know has a lot of um, face-to-face uh, instruction. A lot of students, um, when the, there is an online course, having the same kind of situation. Well, I'm here on campus. Sorry, um, sorry. The people who are on campus taking a one-year leave, being off campus after that, and then finding out that how can I do my program? You know, the course is face-to-face. -face. I finished my one-year leave. I need to be able to access my program somehow. Um, so we've had lots of stories, many, many instances of that. Um, and Jill has also provided, um, I, I talk a bit about your background actually at the college. Um, I'll hand off the mic to you. Thanks, Valerie. Yeah, I actually have a, I guess, a lot of um, varied backgrounds. Um, when I was doing my master's shortly, well, I shouldn't say I finished my master's, but I actually took a little bit longer than uh, than I had anticipated, of course. Justin Bieber. George, was that you, Mr. Justin Bieber? George Bieber? Um, <laughs> <laughs> George Oh, Bieber. my God. Anyway, um, so I, I can't concentrate now. He's terrible. He is. Um, <laughs> when I was doing my master's, I got a, um, a position as an instructional designer and faculty development person at Grant McEwen College in, in Edmonton. And so I did a lot of work, um, actually, and I did that for a year at the University of Alberta as well. So I did a lot of work really looking at faculty, de faculty development and um, really trying to help faculty transform their practice, and, and whether that's using technology or not. And so uh, a lot of push from the administration, even at that time, um, was, well, well, we have to put everything online because online is quicker, better, faster all of these kinds of things and really looking at um, ways to generate revenue. And so um, so I think I do have some perspective, you know, in terms of how the faculty uh, um, really see things and so we can kind of start with that, right? And so let's go on to the next one, shall we, Val? So um, I was really fortunate uh, that 
in I think 2006, we got funding for um, a Thai lab, Technology Integration and Evaluation Research Lab. So about $800,000 in infrastructure that's come forward so far, and Jill will be bringing uh, additional monies with her new CFI coming in. Um, this slide just shows a little caption of a piece of the lab where um, we're trying to merge. Uh, having all these tools at, at our fingertips allowed us to play with um, different delivery pieces, so allowing us to merge face-to-face -face with uh, distributed uh, mobile access. Um, and so, and that's what I hear about UVic, and I'm sure there's many brick and mortar institutions out there. We're a destination university. So, okay, how does a destination university cope with some of the changes coming up? And I'm hoping that we can make the argument that we are a destination in both place and space, being online space. So we have a number of issues uh, also facing these brick and mortar universities, actually in it, many other places as well, and online are facing um, diminishing funds, cutbacks. Um, I know that uh, in Canada, and especially in BC, we are in a pretty good place in compared to other areas of the world. Um, and we do have a decreasing uh, 18 to 22 year old demographic just from that baby boomer echo generation moving on. Um, and we do have an increase in colleges with degree granting status. I know this um, um, large funding grants. No, it's not, actually. This allowed us to play. And I'll talk about cost later. Thank you for the comment, Mark. Um, for example, in our own BEd program in BC, we had four BEd granting institutions, the four large research universities. Now there are a lot of colleges that have been created. And we have, I think, 10 now BEd granting institutions in the province. So uh, with more competition, how do we, how do we meet the needs there? Um, and we have an increase in online programs. I'm hearing about you know, a vice principal down the block taking an online program in the US for her master's. So, um, and then we have the demand for learners for flexibility, how they want to take their program. So um, that's really what we're looking at. Um, how do we support that, that difference? Next slide. Can I do this one, or do you want me? All right, so the brick and mortar versus the online university. So how can the brick and mortar universities adapt, be relevant, compete, and innovate uh, so we are competitive? And I know George is at Athabasca, so again, one of those things, how, how does a brick and mortar place uh, compete against an online program, provide that flexibility, and, and yet stay a brick and mortar university, not add how can we compete with George? This is what it's just all come down to a rivalry of George versus Val. And you can see it on Twitter a lot, actually. He takes a jab at our orcas all the time. And uh, anyhow, and I make fun of George's lust for Justin Bieber. But um, anyhow, uh, so what I talked with our UVic uh, registration system, can we change our registration system to allow the, um, the user to choose, the, the student to choose the delivery method that they want? Um, and I think that can bring a lot of benefit. Um, for example, I had a, um, a colleague who would self-describe herself as not being very tech kind of savvy or comfortable, um, try and do an online course using Moodle, blood, sweat, tears, you know, frustration. And, um, and she is one of our you know, teaching excellence people. Uh, uh, and just this an anecdotal story, the students who were registered with her in their course evaluations had different preferences. The ones who were off campus were thrilled that they were able to complete the program. The ones who were on campus were frustrated that, um, you know, I'm here. Why am I taking an online course with the profits here? So that's an example within one section that we have here of trying to meet two worlds. So, um, and the ability to change a registration increases opportunities for international students to be enrolled. Um, and we do have, uh, again, with these cuts, I, I attended an, an academic leadership retreat and learned that in order to meet revenue needs of the forthcoming years of dwindling funding, and again, this is not a UVic thing, this is an everywhere thing. And in fact, like I said, we're in pretty good shape compared to other universities. Post-secondary education institutions need to focus on two things, two only ways that we can make money, um, course-based master's uh, programs and international student recruitment. So. Um, how are we going to be able to do this? Um, and in Th Victoria, for example, we are not a large city like Vancouver. So how do um, places like uh, here, how do we draw on a larger audience? Um, and so in terms of trying to meet the needs of both the, uh, the distributed learner as well as you know, the, the faculty on campus, 
um, how can we do that? And so we're looking at uh, trying to figure out ways that we can offer um, various types of registration options. So um, currently, you know, everything is housed in a specific building, um, in, spe in a specific room, at a specific day, um, at a speci on a specific day, and at a specific time, or if there's online. And you really only have those two choices in our given registration system. Um, so, for example, if we were wanting to schedule a guest speaker from Stanford, which is something that um, that that Val has done, but we've also done um, a lot of scheduling of guest speakers in our um, undergraduate teacher education course. And so, what we need to do is to make sure that we have a schedule, um, just like we're doing right now in in, in Change Eleven, is setting up the schedule where some people can actually come, but it's at a specific date and time, um, and and it's online. So. If you're running an online course like uh, for the MOOCs in the, in this uh, MOOC in the Change MOOC, for example, um, how do you get students involved when there's no confirmed schedule? And so that is one of the uh, one of the, the large challenges um, that 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 we face, both uh, especially in online classes. Uh, Right. This is a screen capture of you know our registration system. If you wanted to take EDCI 336 section A05, um, you know I put Professor X here, but you'll see that um, you know it just shows face-to-face -face instructional method, and then scheduled meeting times. We have the building, the room, the date, the time. Uh, the next slide, um, if we move over to that one, is for an online course, and this is our other option, right? Professor X online campus every week TBA time TBA where and there's no you know, place in holding. So these are the two options that we have. I talked with, uh, like I said, to our registration system about having, we can have either a two-tier registration option, multi-access is what the term I came up with for this, is a multi-access course. And so students can choose section A01, and that could be the face-to-face, -face, room day time, room capacity. Uh, section A02 would be the online, and we could even you know, put in the description, this is when the face-to-face -face time is slotted. If you do want to have it live, you can, but not necessary. We could even have a tier 3, if we have rooms that are video conference enabled, people could even video conference in already. So um, that's probably less likely that we would have a three-tier uh, registration multi-access system. But this is what we're looking at for um, uh, how the revisions are going to be made. And then rather than it adding up to, I think, a you know, three FTE for me, it would show up, for example, as it would be one FT, and we would have cumulative registration adding up to the class max. Um, exactly, Val. I just wanted to add as well. Like, I, mean, I know it might initially seem like, well, this isn't really, you know, a terribly innovative approach or anything like that in terms of how the the registration is is set up. But at universities, especially, you know, um, the brick and mortar ones. Any change to registration system, whether it's you know very small, we we are kind of a slave to that system. So whether it's PeopleSoft or whatever, so we're all constantly trying to find those workarounds, right? Yeah, and so it's how much? A hundred thousand dollars every time we make make a small change, you know, a, a little text change um, in in the administration system. Um, so this is really, I think, quite an innovative step. Um, it's not about making that like making a significant change on the administration side. Can I just jump in a little bit? Uh, I know you're, you're uh, obviously have some activities to like to go through, so I'm going to randomly intervene here and, and just say when you're when we're talking the models that you're exploring here, where you're looking at just something as simple as different registration models and how that can improve the experience or at least impact the experience of students. Um, as I think it was Jill and perhaps Valerie that mentioned that. You know, this isn't necessarily something that's you know earth-shatteringly new, but there's such a dearth of innovation in higher education that even when we start changing, you know, paint color in a classroom, we're really at the cutting edge of innovation because it's it's so surprisingly limited. But I'd, I'd like to hear, in terms of the students that you're dealing with, you mentioned earlier, Valerie, that you have some students who are you know, close location to where you live that are taking courses down in the U.S. with online systems. What is the demand like that you find within, whether it's just within BC or broadly within Canada and beyond, but what's the demand like for students that want this blend of either online and face-to-face -face options? Is, that, is there something from a user perspective that's driving some of your thinking in this regard? 
Um, yeah, I, I mean, just uh, to talk about experience, I've had um, people from Vancouver repeatedly ask if they could do a PhD with me or a master's with me, and then it's, but stay in Vancouver. Um, and that's one piece where I find rather frustrating because I would love to have you as a distant student. I would accept you as a distant student, um, but I can't control my colleagues who, you know, teach the core research methods course or what have you face to face. So that's been an obstacle. I mean, this is why I've been wondering how do I work around this? Um, and the to get those colleagues to go into an online environment, pretty hard. Um, like I said, the, the, um, I'm piloting a grad course right now with a colleague, the same one who had the bimodal opinions of the students in an online class, so saying, oh, yeah, I can go back to my community, the other one saying, I'm here. Um, the, the frustration in mounting that online course, the lack of support, um, because you need a lot of support, especially if someone's not that tech savvy, to go into that, that world, and then they really have to adapt quite a bit. So the same colleague came into um, the room we have on display there. This is one of the VC rooms, and frankly, it doesn't all have to be like this. This is you know, very high tech. Um, we can have portable VC solutions going around and other ways we can do it. Um, but um, she brought her class into this room. You see where that laptop is? She just plugged in her laptop. Her class sat around. We have a cluster on. She pressed record, and that whole thing can be automated for her you know, anywhere, and um, anywhere on campus. And she it was rather, that's it? <laughs> and I remember being up on the fifth floor looking at the live stream of the video plus the content uh, being shared. And the students in the class were quite excited. They thought, this is really innovative. You know? And also, I get to go back and you know, watch again. Um, the whole thing can be password protected. This is where we talk about openness and MOOCs and all that kind of thing. It, is, it can be connected to um, with the system we have, uh, LDAP, which is our Active Directory, what, for those of you who know that technical term, but um, our class list. So I can have our class list that's you know refreshed every day with whoever is enrolled in the course, like we do with Moodle, drops and adds. Same thing with who can have access to this uh, stream, this um, and so forth. I'm going to let you follow the moderating of the text because it's one thing to talk, and know, it's great to present with someone. You can say, yeah, I'll, I'll look at it when you talk, and you look at it when I talk. Um, and so that's a really interesting feature because I think taking regular faculty and making the jump to being running an open course, um, that I think it's going to be rather difficult. And I think jumping to being online and streamed, but password protected, in my hunch is that's going to be an intermediate step. Once they're comfortable in that environment, releasing that lock will be another thing. Um, I was asked once about student privacy. Well, what about students if they don't want to be live streamed, don't want to be recorded? Um, I was told by our central people that it's OK as long as you provide an alternative for them. So in this instance, the face-to-face -face class is going to be open for recording. If you're not comfortable with that, we'll go into the online section. As long as you provide an, an alternative, then you're not subject to like, an appeal where you're, you're not letting me take the course. So um, that would be a condition of enrolling in the face-to-face in -face class. Um, sure. OK, I don't, you've read it, so you can talk to the point. Okay. All right, I'll release this, but um, all right, Jill. Thanks, Val. Um, so I was just wanting to talk a little bit about what um, Mark had said in the chat window. He said, talks about, you know, saying that Clickers in the Classroom gets funding because it's seen as innovative um, at his university, and you know, believe it, it it's, it's the same here as well. You know, where, funda where it's a fundamental change that is really needed. Um, so we would say, well, who in the system benefits from, from challenging the system? Where within the system is the incentive and reward system for real change? Um, in our experience, especially with, uh, if, we, if I can use a case example, um, with um, this, this, this professor in our faculty here, and you know, she sees herself as a real Luddite, and she really wanted to, and her primary concern, which is, I think, which is everybody's concern, is to think about, well, we want the students to benefit first, from, first and foremost from the system. Um, and you know, getting good course evaluations and all that kind of stuff is really important to faculty members as well. And using the system the way that um, that Valerie was explaining it in something that it seems relatively seamless to the faculty member um, makes it, I think, a lot easier them easier for them to transition. You know, whereas going to an online 
online class uh, the way that they've traditionally been taught, you know, is uh, text-based and, and, and all that kind of stuff. It's a very, very different teaching model, very, very different teaching style. And so um, a lot of people are, aren't they're really comfortable with that because of the way that it makes them as instructors feel so separated from their students and things like that. So what we're trying to do here is offer a bridge between you know, where, where we can bridge um, and offer that kind of flexibility, but also have the real-time interaction and all of the, uh, the collaboration among students um, as well as um, with that faculty member as well. So trying to maintain that level of engagement has really been very important. Um, so there's some more questions there, Val? me. I got it, I think. You got it? Okay. I think I got it. <laughs> okay. So I guess um, I'll move on. Sure. That brings us to the um, the whole idea of the multi-access learning environment. Yeah. What? You want to go next slide? Okay. Sorry. I don't think that was okay. This there, she caught me. I was going to talk without my mic on. Um, so this is an example of, I don't know, a layout to try and get people familiar with what this is. Uh, top being the columns of learner access. So. Um, you know, there are predominantly two ways, distributed online and face-to-face -face learner access. When we offer a face-to-face -face course on the left there of the rows, you know, right there we're not having any distributed online connections. Again, the video conference is rare, but actually I do get a lot of requests for video conference access to courses just because we have it. Once we know we have it, I get a lot of requests. So it is an option. Um, blended, you know, we still have a face-to-face -face element in a lot of blended classes. So again, it's not entirely distributed online. So for a student who wants to be entirely distributed online, they only have, you know, the latter, the bottom two choices, online classes or it would be multi-access class. So right there we're cutting out registration possibilities for increasing our enrollment. And when you said who benefits and why, I think I saw that earlier, um, the who benefits uh, could also be the faculty members who want to run that grad course or want to run something and, you know, get canceled and everyone's heard of stories like that where it's such a drag if we had more or if you have the minimum, then why aren't we getting more enrollments and getting more money? Um, we're actually um, presenting on this this Friday to our Minister of Advanced Education and Deputy Minister this Friday for British Columbia. So that's like, you know, a province is like a state, right? So this is the top of the food chain where we're going to be talking about uh, possibly how we can support uh, our brick and mortar universities. I think uh, there was a request that we increase, I'm just trying to remember the exact stat, but our, our advanced ed ministry said we, they want us to increase our international student enrollment by, like, I think quadrupled in five years or something like that. How are we going to do that? I also heard that they don't want to have it uh, quadrupled by all online registrations within five years because online enrollment um, has pays less tuition. So they want face to face. So how are we going to bring in all these um, international students to you that to meet that? It's going to be a challenge. If uh, if multi access, I mean, we're still heating a room. Right? We're still lighting things, we're still doing all of this. Uh, a multi-access environment could still charge uh, full enrollment for being here because we are running like a face-to-face -face class as opposed to just being online only. We're heating it and all that jazz. So, hold on, you have a comment, Jill? It's so, so easy to just kind of yak. Um, anyway, so I was just going to say that it, and, and having things offered that way, um, really is a lot of the faculty concerns about quality, um, which is a really big concern for them is that, well, I don't want to go online because I do feel that it's a poor quality or I get, you know, poor, you know, return on my effort, right, um, in, in terms of, you know, the kinds of interactions that they can have with the students. So um, that's really a big concern and I think one that, um, that, that we all face, you know, as, as uh, distributed educators. All right. The other thing, actually, uh, I'd like to suggest is that um, you know UVic is a research-intensive institution, um, so there are teaching places and there are places that are teaching and research. So we're one of those, um, and we do have some fantastic minds here, you know, Nobel Prize winners and that kind of thing. So if we have Canada research chairs and fantastic minds, I do know that a lot of them aren't going uh, to online because they do have the paucity of face-to-face -face people to meet their needs. Um, again, with how easy this was for our pilot to go uh, multi-access, it could be a way for us to take some of our best scholars and making them more accessible uh, to the international community for learning. Um, so I think that you know could be an argument for uh, quality of education, um, being able to access some of those some of those people that we have here.
Another piece of this in terms of the student benefit, um, giving them an, an opportunity for choice is really a part of, um, you know, from a theoretical standpoint, will promote um, student agency and, and, uh, and their, their own self-regulation, self-regulation of learning. By expanding um, into, you know, it, it, this whole idea of emergence of choice, you know, expanding to anytime, anywhere, um, you know, where social media and personalized learning networks expand this to with anyone. Um, and, you know, from Valerie and I's perspective, we would like to expand this to in any way because the needs of the learners, have, as we all know, has obvious, they have obviously been changing quite, um, quite dramatically with the increased cost of attending a post-secondary, um, you know, with uh, the way, you know, families are currently structured. It's, it's very difficult for a lot of students to come, come around and just be in school full time. So um, I think, you know, treating them like adults and allowing them to regulate their, their own learning and their own choices um, is, is really important and it's critical. Um, so really we transfer, in, in addition to doing all that, we, we transfer the locus of, of control of course access to the, to the learner so that um, it's flexible, it's in the access their, their, their courses and, and other students in ways that they see fit. So this is a, a, a sample of the skin that we have. Um, we, uh, the tool we purchased um, with the Coordinate Media Management System uh, that has a, a capture. And this is what the interface would look like on an iPad. Um, uh, this actually was a um, sort of a mock-up by Jill to show, show the pretty, make it pretty. But uh, the, the latter can be like a video into anywhere. This was a, a K-12 classroom in Alberta. So a way for us to bring in, um, you know, if it's VC connected, we can do this quite easily, bring in whatever from wherever um, into the video portion, the right side being the content that's on the, the present presenter's uh, laptop. So if you see that student at the back is playing with GPS, you know, if that's the content, you would see it on the right side. Um, you can actually flip swap. There's closed captioning chapters. There's PDF files that you could download or hyperlinks, email, uh, that kind of thing, or you can zoom into one or the other. Uh, the fact that we can live stream this to an iPad, um, you know, is I think pretty cool. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're we're planning to demo this on Friday, and uh, also for those of you who've heard about Blue Jeans Network, um, we've played around with merging Blue Jeans Network with our Accordant Media Management System um, to do a, um, you know, to do a, a, a combo. The Blue Jeans Network I just found out has a total cap of 25. Um, uh, people connecting. That's not really good enough uh, for a lot of classes. Um, the current media management system can, like with adding extra equipment, it could go up to like 150,000, like Intel apparently uses it to live stream to 150,000 shareholders. So there is an ability. And the cost though, can we support the cost of this? Um, I was looking at uh, like our capture station. If we wanted to make more capture stations in rooms or connected to VCs that could port into any room with a portable VC system, um, if it's $25,000 for a capture station, I'll say 20 for easy math. And then if we say that we can fit four classes of three-hour classes in a day, five across the week, so that would be 20 classes that could be multi-access in a week, um, that would mean $1,000 per class for shared portion of getting a a second capture station or a third or fourth or however we expand it. Um, now tuition is about five or six hundred dollars a student. So that would mean two student uh, enrollees that we can get would cover the cost of the capture station. Obviously we want more for the staffing and those kind of things behind the, the scenes, but um, international students pay three times the tuition. So there's a draw that way. Um, I, I believe this is um, uh, cost recoverable and actually even profitable. Um, to be able to do it in this way, in this fashion. And like I said, brick and mortar then can keep our face-to-face -face students happy and coming here. And we need them here. We need them here to be our research assistants. You know, that we need them here for, like we depend on them. Um, and I know there's lots of things we can have them do online, but there's a lot that we need them to be here for. So um, anyhow, I will uh, pass it on to Jill to go to the next piece, or do you want me to cover this? Um, now, cool. Remember, George? Okay, I'll, I could give the mic over here to you. I admit I don't like the term MOOC. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't sound pretty for me. It MOOC. It's uh, so I do like cool, and I can't remember the fellow's name, Steve or someone in Tokyo, had the cool cast. And so I do love collaborative open online course. Um, 
And multi-axis course doesn't mean it's it's a MOOC. <laughs> Am I a kook? Or a coog? There you go. <laughs> um, so multi-axis course could be LDAP protected, right? Password protected for everything. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's online, or sorry, online, open. Um, but it can be made into having an open counterpart, um, and then therefore a MOOC. I personally like to see them called cool courses at UVic, um, and uh, and so forth. Um, just Lebeau, there we go. Um, but I love that term. Um, and so, uh, but what we need to do is try and increase the two-way communication. Our system does have a QA feature that when it's live, a QA tab pops up, and then you type in your name, and then um, it goes uh, it goes to the, the presenter. There's Blue Jeans Network, BJN there, Twitter, other ways that we can try. And we're just completely playing right on, like we're playing and testing Blue Jeans an hour ago, so this is like as new as it can get. Um, and the Blue Jeans support people from somewhere in the States. Where was he, anyhow? Um, was coming in and connecting to Valley somewhere. <laughs> somewhere, but to try and, you know, like, hey, let's see what this looks like. So. Um, yeah, you can grab the mic. I talk too much. I know. I'm sorry. Here you go. You know, I, I think one of the most consistent responses we've seen is that people don't like the word MOOC, and I don't know why, but uh, that's you know, you're in good company there, and I do agree that collaborative open online learning is a better uh, term as well, or MOOCs. <laughs> But uh, you know, I think one of the things too is that you know, MOOC has gotten uh, maybe if nothing else, people hate it and it's gotten a bit of traction. Just like blogs, when I first heard blogs, everybody hated the word blog. It's an ugly word. It sounds like you're about to, I don't know, you're clearing your throat. But uh, for some reason, it's managed to stick. Maybe because it's not exactly the uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, that's not really what I wanted to talk about, though. Uh, I think, and I, I think what's what's is is valuable here is. You know, for when you're branding these kinds of concepts, what's important now is that there needs to be a body of literature around the impact of open online courses. And I know Stephen mentioned this in his uh, Oil Daily just last week, or was it this week? I'm not sure when it was, but uh, he talked about Rita Kopp, who's published a fair bit on this, actually. And she's developed a reasonable research base on this. And I think there's others that are going to start jumping in. Certainly the Stanford example is one. And as universities such as uh, yours start to experiment with COOL, which, you know, collaborative open online learning, I think is, you know, whatever. Uh, language, you know, can be used for different purposes, whether it's marketing or promotion. But I think what's important is that a literature base be established that allows these different, the experiences from different domains and different implementations, varying levels of openness and closeness to be able to communicate with one another. I just want to push back a little bit at the point you made, Valerie, and I understand what you're saying about universities need, need these master students and you want them to come to your space. Uh, since we're talking about the future of the university, and I'm sure you're going to be moving in that direction uh, as you keep going through the presentation, but uh, what if that's not the model going forward? Uh, what if in the future the grad student uh, is not used as uh, sort of slave labor to meet the needs of existing tenured faculty? Uh, what if the, that whole master's model of a learner is rethought and suddenly it's far more emphasized on the strength of uh, you know, individual control and autonomy. And the reason I say this, as, as you do, uh, Valerie and Jill as well, you, you chat with a lot of folks in the academic space. Um, I'm finding that a lot of folks who've been in higher education for a long period of time, I would not want them teaching my kids about technology and education because I don't think they're current and I don't think they're informed and I don't think they understand the nature of some of those changes. So maybe we need to rethink that whole master's model as well in terms of uh, who's teaching in this context really. I'm going to go first and we're going to finish with Val. She's going she's gonna to drop kick that one, I'm sure. <laughs> but, um, no, absolutely. I think that um, a lot of emphasis I think at least like you were talking about George is going towards um, a master's program that is um, more based in reality as opposed to you know um, moving towards a, a, a theoretical uh, PhD type of type of thing um, there's a lot more emphasis or at least uh, there is now in terms of moving uh, having a master's program that that is applied, right? So more of a professional-based master's program where um, we support people, uh, we, we support teachers um, through their um, going to, into administration, for example, and, and and moving in that space. And I think it is really important that um, when somebody is going on 
to um, you know to get to get their PhD or to get an um, even an uh, a doctorate in education so and ed that they do have a lot of professional experience um, as well as um, reach out into the community and working with partners in industry because it is really important that um, that we, that there are those ties. And so not everybody's going to come and do a, a, a PhD in education and want to be a professor. And to, to, be, to be all honest, um, that's a role that isn't fit for everyone. And there aren't enough jobs out there for um, people with PhDs anyway. So what are some um, alternatives to that, right? So what can a person do who wants to move into a professional area and, and that kind of thing? Did you have some out there, Bill? Sure. Um, yeah, you were talking about uh, the interest in, in masters uh, coming to like coming here and needing to have someone who has tech savviness as well in what they learn. Um, if I'm if I'm grasping the question the same, I picked up on that point. Um, not every discipline, um, I think, has a culture of technology innovation. Um, do I need to emphasize that that prof has to have that? They may be a, an, and they may excel in their domain because they haven't had that focus. Perhaps I don't know. This is this is just shooting from my opinion. Um, but you know, it could be that. And I know some people I, I re really respect who have like the best expertise in, let's say, history or something, some other um, uh, discipline that doesn't necessarily demand knowledge of what a MOOC is or what a you know what, what have you or use clickers. I think the supports come in from the university on that. I would like them to focus on what they're good at and their knowledge at, and they're getting the shirks, they're getting the Canada research chairs. I think they need to, at least at a research university, focus on that excellence and have us come in um, as a you know from university systems perspective and and help with that. Um, did, did you know what I mean? Um, so I think I think I'd like to see everyone there. But I think I'd rather them be really damn good at what they do, and let um, let the support system come around them to make sure that the way they're teaching, or that they're being modern with how they are doing their teaching. Um, and like I said, I think going straight to uh, te well, technically, yeah. Um, but I want I want someone for being the best prof in their area, um, and I want to know the cutting edge knowledge that's coming out from their theories. Uh, and that's what research intensive universities do, and it blows my mind the stuff that's always coming out um, of the hallways. So um, we have lots of we have lots of huge things too, like you know Neptune and climate research and these kinds of things at UVic, which I, they're staying at UVic because we don't have online programs. Uh, we don't have them expanding in that way. So I think we need to really focus on how do we get that dissemination of knowledge out. And I think this is a way that we can without taxing them incredibly and converting to these. Courses. Um, anyhow, that's my point back. I have to read this. I thought you're going to be answering while I'm. Oh, okay. She's slacking on her job. She's like, okay, you've got to answer that. I haven't read it. I'm talking. I'm not very good at multitasking, right? So, see, there you go. Um, I'm going to go to. Do you want to go to the next slide? And I can try and catch them up on the. Or do you want this near you? We kind of already covered that a bit. Yeah, this is kind of how we are the go about. Do you want me? To, these are students. Yeah, I'll go with these ones. This was. Uh, these were comments by distributed learning students that I had who had access. It wasn't a multi-access course. It was an online course in which I uh, I used the system to give them some of the. Uh, um, uh, some of the content, and then I had used blogs and Twitter as a way for them to do some of their assignments. And so, this is interesting. A uh, student said, "I've been requesting these types of interaction assignments, and activities in the distance, whatever program they're in, elsewhere." Um, and I think to have a video of the instructor to go over the outline and welcome students to the class is great. And they were, and this was a common theme across my students. Um, and I had a smart board in the back of me, and I could pull up the uh, the outline. The outline could also be sent as content, and I could go over and talk them through it. If you think about what we do in online courses, we post a PDF file, right? And when you think about a face-to-face -face class, we take the entire first day, usually at least an hour, um, going over the course outline. So there's 
ways I think that we're dropping the ball when we are teaching online and um, having that that I mean that was a common point brought up in blog posts or brought up in the in the course evaluations and that they were you know it was I was surprised they were so taken aback by it um, but I think um, I think that's something for us to be aware of if we are teaching online how are we covering that uh, another student comment uh, Someone else is just sending, switching up two online courses at a major online university, um, and they're hoping that you know that online university uh, uh, will start to implement this technology in some of their courses. And this was interesting. This technology they're referring to, I think, was more the the blogs and the Twitter and that kind of interaction. But I was also using our our video system. So the role of video um, is coming out. As, a, as an interesting need, I think uh, we need to really look at this again and how we are delivering education because if it's more ubiquitous, not such a hassle for the downloads and we can access it, uh, like I said, on iPads or mobile devices, then um, we may want to do that. Uh, so here's another one. I also want to share how weird and awesome it, I think it is that I can catch my professor in Victoria guest lecture booth in Alberta, the slides for his talk, take notes, and email my room a Depeche Mode video from YouTube, all from my kitchen in Montreal. All right. So that's that's someone who we need to cater to, the multitasking uh, distance learner. But uh, we need to um, be able to meet those needs at the same time as those graduate students who are feeding us with their time. And, uh, and helping us in our research programs and then gaining that new knowledge hands on. Okay, you want to go? Yep. All right, all right. I'm just trying to keep Bell in line. I um, just want to address a couple of the, the questions that came up. Hey, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> between me. you and George, I don't know if, I can, if I'm going to make it here. Um, in terms of I mean, UVic is a research intensive university, but it is also um, what we call an undergraduate education, a comprehensive university. So we do try and, and, and help our, our professors um, really become better at teaching. So supporting them through, um, you know, developing their courses, looking, uh, aligning their objectives, but also trying to use innovative practice. And so um, talking about uh, any, university, any university teaching is your selling point, so you must be good in teaching. And I think um, that's a very, very excellent point in that, um, you know, we really do want to be good, good, good teachers, at least most of the professors that, you know, that, that I've met, even the Nobel laureates, they, they want to be good teachers and they want to be able to, to connect um, with, with their students and tell them how, how excited they are and try and communicate that excitement. Um, but they really don't get that, you know, a lot of uh, experience um, or even any kind of formal training in, in, in how to do that. So I think um, the support systems become even more important. And I think uh, also um, the faculties of education in, in institutions across the country also have a very important role to play um, in helping to bridge that gap and helping to educate our peers um, on, on our discipline. You know, and I think that hasn't been happening enough. Um, at least, in definitely in in my in my experience. Um, there was another question here. Um, uh, Mark was asking if the tech can be easier and cheaper in time as well as money than offline preparation and delivery techniques, and there's a better chance of involving academics. Um, uh, who are not tech-centered, and and this is exactly the point we we're trying to make with um, with with our colleague here is that in using something um, that kind of bridges bridges the, the divide between uh, the strictly online text-based um, distributed learning format and a face-to-face -face class, something that integrates with with the way that she teaches a lot more seamlessly um, with 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 the the whole idea of just you know clicking one button or two buttons and uh, just and letting her the point. And, and, and letting her go forward naturally is, is very important and I think it's definitely a, um, a really great selling feature um, because they do want to reach out to more um, to more people, uh, more students. Okay, back to you, Bill. And, and going into that also, um, seeing the sparkle in the eye uh, in, that, in that first session um, of that instructor because she had the face-to-face -face students around her was um, Pretty amazing. I was so tickled watching that. And we had all these props come down the hall who were not really talking about going online ever. Came down the hall, peeking and looking at my laptop and going, "Oh my God! Oh my God!" And suddenly, we should do this. Ah, 
<laughs> I've been talking forever and we should do this, right? But it, it's, it's one thing to talk about doing it via Moodle. <laughs> and then seeing this happen and seeing that, you know, uh, who it was who was doing it and, and seeing, like I said, the sparkle in the eye and the smile and the engagement with the students going on, um, it, was, it was pretty, I don't know, I thought it was pretty beautiful. Um, the alternative, and I've even, like when I've tried to do some of the, the captures with just me, myself, and I, you start out great. You go, hey, I'm your instructor, and here's, and, you know, but there's no one in the room, and your smile starts slowly going down. And so um, that's, that's something I think that multi-access can actually bring a richness back to the online world um, where we, we can see the smile. And there you go. You can see one of our grad students smiling in this example. This is just a sample of the, uh, the interface. Um, so you can click on swap video and slide. The video being on the large piece that that test that's just a sample that's like a blank PowerPoint slide. It's whatever would be on your your laptop. Anything you can even play. We can even connect to, connect to our uh, DVD. Um, and then uh, the next slide shows that swapped, and then you can zoom out. You can zoom into either one. So um, oh, I guess I didn't put the other one. I thought I had two. We can go to the next slide though. Okay, what percentage of your courses are now at? Probably, well, it depends, right? It's, it's like, uh, you know, when you say what tier is the university? I don't think, I don't believe in universities being tier one, tier two kind of thing. I think you have to look at every university because I've been at two tier one universities and you can find tier two stuff going on. You, know, you can go to a tier two university and you can find such tier one stuff going on. So there are certain programs that we have that are so heavy online. I think we have nursing. I think we have human social development. I mean, we've got the Island Medical Program, which is totally distributed across the province. Um, so it depends on the pockets to go to other places. Like psychology has never had an online course before. I think they're doing their very first one this term. So, um, and they were looking at exploring multi-access as well. This, this is now going around uh, that this is, this is here and this is a possibility. Um, so I think it depends on the on the context of every department or every program who's involved. Um, but yeah, this was just an example of like this could be a video into also anywhere because we do hook up our system into a video conference unit as opposed to just being a lecture capture kind of thing plugged into a lecture room and ported by the internet back to our, our management system. If we, we've hooked up our capture sy uh, uh, system to our video conference room, so now I could go in and capture in the, into this. I, you know, George has a VC room over in Athabasca. I can go and capture him beautifully with his, you know, uh, stuff with a Blue Jeans network and bring it all together. It'd be yes, as beautifully as George can be captured. She said that, George, not me. I'm just getting them back. Oh, <laughs> uh, the Justin Bieber. That's, the, that's my fault. I think I brought that up. Uh, next slide. How are we doing for time of 10 minutes? How are we through our slides? Oh, we're almost near the end. I think we are right at the end. What's the last bit? That's our contact information. Yay! Um, so, yeah, we're going to, like I said, on, it's going to be a little on the risky side, but on, uh, on Friday we are going to try and do the, the live stream combined with the Blue Jeans network. And and content and share that with everybody. And although Blue Jeans will only allow 25 people to join, so you know, looking that we had 20 today, maybe that would be fine. Um, and also, people can sign in, sign out of uh, from Skype. But um, we can make that information available closer to Friday. But I think it's 4:30 Pacific Standard Time on Friday that we'll come back again, and that will be definitely more discussion-y, quote answers, that kind of thing. Do I insist that using BGN in the future? Uh, BCNet, which is um, kind of our uh, advisory group for all the CIOs of the big four universities in British Columbia, um, they purchased the licensing for Blue Jeans and they're making it. I'm on some of their committees. Uh, they're sort of our um, high bandwidth you know, group as well. For those of you who know Canary in Canada, BCNet is kind of the provincial version of it. Um, so they're, they're providing that to us. and um, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see how how that emerges. They're going to be moving towards recording. I just found out today from them directly, and uh, they're looking at trying to increase their their cap. It is a bit pricey for that, but um, you know we'll see how that goes. Yeah, trading eliminate. That's that's the question. Do we you know? I think I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this moves forward in the future. I can also I can probably see if we can share that demo we did today. I'll get permission to see if we can share that on Friday with 
Uh, I have to ask permission because we recorded it from the people to show you a little bit of how we captured blue genes within our, our lecture capture system. So how that works. I'll let you have the mic. Hold on. In terms of the, the whole trading in of Illuminate, um, I could definitely see that see that happening because there are some um, viable, uh, very viable open source alternatives that are out there for that. Um, and with Illuminate being uh, being in the U.S., um, there are some serious concerns around um, the 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 Patriot Act, especially here in British Columbia. Um, so, you know, us being able to have this system set it up so that it's housed within the Canadian borders. Um, you know, does I suppose kind of well, it does get around that particular issue as far as the ethics boards and uh, the administration are concerned. Um, of course, with the trading in of Illuminate, which is housed and hosted and all that kind of stuff by Blackboard, then um, it's, it's going to require obviously that we need to have more resources um, on site to be able to um, set up and use these um, these open source types of software. Illuminate was Calgary based, yeah, they, they they definitely were. I'm not. Um, I think they're. I'm pretty sure that they're in the U.S., um, but I'm not sure. It's. Sure. it's Is there anything that touches the server in the U.S.? Anything that that kind of that even routes through the uh, routes through the the U.S. is a problem. Um, yeah, this is true, Stephen. That pretty much all our all our information is being shared with the U.S. anyway. Well, this is true, um, but let, let us let us not be the ones uh, who 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 are sharing it. I suppose. Um, I had a comment. You had a comment, Beth? Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I'm all for all the talk we had about openness and things like that, but I also know that a lot of our leaders in BC does have a conservative privacy policy um, that um, Illuminate even, I think, has a clause somewhere in there that says that all content and everything is owned by Illuminate, or I guess it's Blackboard now. I assume that that agreement is still in the fine print. So we, I do know there are definitely people within um, our institution who are not happy at all that we even have that system because it just takes one student complaint to say that we've just taken that student uh, and given ownership to the company, and so they're they you know it's under um, a evaluation right now. We're doing evaluation of uh, synchronous systems and you know what to support at this at this very moment at our institution. But I do know Patriot Act is right up there is something they're looking at, worried about, and then clauses like that are. Um, yeah, are of concern. Yet we, we lose all of our fins in a recent security oh, breach. <laughs> I had to close my bank accounts and you know put credit file alerts on everything. And yet we and yet we worry about you know do we use Illuminate? Um, but there you go. All right. Well, at this point, if there's any questions from anyone in the audience, uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand, type in your question, or, or whatever you wish in order to uh, tackle some of these questions or the reaction to the presentation. As Valerie mentioned, the Friday session will likely be a bit more uh, Q&A focused. So if uh, you don't have anything to ask right now, feel free to review the videos that they posted for this week's reading and then pick it up later on. Um, if I could just throw a quick question out your way about what do you see happening? I mean, what you presented today was a view of education that challenges the, maybe not challenges, but that provides greater options for learners in terms of place of learning. Um, it still is somewhat strongly confined in a traditional university model, you know, course based and those kinds of activities. Access is, is the novelty, but it's still the, the general model is similar to regular university education. What are your thoughts in terms of when do we start to see the model itself changing rather than access approaches being the innovation? Well, right now our K-12 system is going through um, uh, a big um, sort of, I don't know what you would call it, there's, a, there's something called BC Ed Plan and if you're interested you can follow the hashtag um, and there's also an interactive document and the talk is about trying to have, I think, fewer outcomes and letting students personalize their learning. Um, if that's achieved at the K-12 level, then we're going to have more and more students coming through um, into university from at least our province with a very different way of looking at uh, learning. And so that's another thing that's uh, on the agenda of many meetings here at, at uh, UVic. Uh, if we do have uh, this different kind of learner now that's, if that's achieved, you know, how do we then continue that? We're going to have to change how things are done at UVic. Um, I'm 
I'm not sure how this is going on elsewhere. Uh, I, I know best what's in my backyard, really. Um, but I think that's one real piece of how do we make you know make it about the person. Um, and I try and do that whenever possible in every single one of my outlines, saying, "You want to do something else? Pitch it. You know, pitch your proposal for something completely different." Because I am a strong believer in uh, making a problem-based, self-directed, that kind of thing. So you've also talked about, or briefly touched on, there's different needs that students have in the university system. They want some access opportunities that uh, the traditional physical campus exclusive model doesn't necessarily allow. But it sounds like from what your presentation coming up on Friday to a, a group within BC, it sounds like there is at least some receptivity on the part of government to rethinking the delivery model within universities. What's driving their thinking? Is it primarily financial, the way you started uh, chatting earlier, or, or a better education? Or what's some of the thinking around why you, you managed to get some traction with the BC government? Um, well, I think it, it definitely is, uh, uh, first and foremost, in the administration's mind, um, entirely about finances and how uh, and, and how we can have, um, you know, it, how we can generate the funds to keep people employed, really, you know, and how we can 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 keep our our, our institutions running. And the only way to do that is to is to really um, increase our enrol our enrollment. And you know, the more people, the more FTE we have, you know, the more the more funding we get from the government. Um, so uh, I think that's initially um, their biggest concern. Um, it's not to say that they don't support other you know other kinds of innovations. Um, we just have to construct the argument around them. Um, there's a really good question here about um, to what extent are universities supportive of open um, openness in, in teaching and learning, like to Stanford and, and MIT. I know here, um, you know, we are certainly we can make all of our materials open um, as much as we want. But when it comes down to evaluating students, um, they have to be enrolled in that class, they have to be um, actually paying um, to be in that class. And I know for um, for MITx, at least the, the way that that model is working is that they are, um, they are from what it sounds like, uh, they are essentially creating, um, you know, like MIT extension, you know, like as a faculties of extension um, or the, you know, center for distance education um, that, that happen at a lot of in other institutions. The only real difference is that all of the content that they are making is going to continue to be online. Um, but if a student wants to uh, get a certificate, then they do have to pay. So if they want to pay um, to have somebody evaluate their progress, they they will get an MIT degree, but it won't. It'll be an MIT X degree. So um, you know, and what kind of value uh, companies and other organizations will place on on that kind of degree? I think remains to be seen, but I think it's um, it's definitely a viable option. Um, and uh, as, as we all know now, um, it's uh, with the whole 21st century thing, it's really about the kind of competency and the kind of skill you have in a particular area, not necessarily your knowledge base. Um, so that's my point of view anyway. Do you want to, do you have anything to say about that? Is it good? Um, Uh, do we have any target learners or just any qualified ones in the world? Frankly, um, I mean, I know there's a there's a higher up, higher admin interest in getting international learners, um, and so I think there's an interest there to get to international learners. Um, preferably, again, they were talking face to face, but I'm going to suggest that we can actually meet that need by multi-access. Um, and UVic is, a, yeah, UVic is a public university. Um, but I frankly, for for my drive, for you know this. Um, this multi-access idea is um, that we can make learners satisfied by having choice. And again, uh, I think you'll find most people are in an area of study through some sort of personal story in their background. You know why why they went into something or why they have a, a passion. My passion is the pissed offness that I was told I couldn't do something the way I wanted to do it. <laughs> so I'm a bit of a stubborn person, and uh, so um, yeah, the, the memories. Like I said, I'll I'll bring it back to the beginning being over in uh, Edmonton. And again, I left Vancouver for Edmonton. Um, brr, cold. And uh, I did that for no reason. 
and I was there to have face-to-face -face instruction and I got three online courses. That is a frustration and that something's wrong about that. I should have been able to choose. We have the technology to allow people to choose. And, uh, and same thing, I hate hearing about people who want to work with me and yet, I'm sorry, all the grad courses are face-to-face -face that are core. Um, I can't accept you, wicked, amazing, you know, master's or PhD student because our program's face-to-face. -face. I think that's going to be gone. I think the amount of people in my department who's sniffed around this, I think we're going to be doing a lot more multi-access. So it'll probably be the first piloted group on campus, I would imagine, even though we have other people from other faculties coming now to say, hey, I want to see what you're doing. Um, uh, I think, so the drive there is for uh, meeting the needs of learners and letting them choose um, my little hang up. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks all for uh, certainly uh, your questions and comments in the discussion areas that are going on, and for uh, Jillian and Dolly for providing an introduction to some of the work that they're involved in, and uh, certainly some of the exciting prospects for increasing learner access. Currently, we are meeting again on Friday. Uh, that'll be posted in the daily, but it's also on the main uh, change.moc.ca website, so you can find that there as well. I'm going to end the recording here, and again, thanks very much for attending, and thanks for your presentation. Thank you, everybody.